Well, good morning. <clears throat> it's good to see you all. Wonderful to gather together on this beautiful Lord's Day uh, for worship and for the study of God's Word. This morning we're going to be turning, uh, continuing in our study in the book of Numbers to Numbers chapter 9, and uh, we will pray and then get to the text. Let's pray. Our Father, it is a spectacular morning. But in light of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, every morning is a spectacular morning. But we thank you especially when we wake up and we see the sun and uh, the skies. And on this, uh, this great Lord's Day, we meet together to turn to worship you and to study your word. And we pray to do so in ways that are most faithful and fruitful. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Well, as we are walking through numbers, verse by verse and chapter by chapter, we are in a sense walking through the history of Israel. And we are looking at one of the most definitive experiences of Israel as it's wandering in the wilderness. And I think it's perhaps helpful for us to think about the wandering in the wilderness for a moment and, and remember that this was in the, the the plan and purpose of God, that this was a punishment for Israel's disobedience and lack of faith. But it was also a time of testing and a time for the establishing of Israel as a new nation. And so God is actually using this opportunity to flesh out the, uh, the worship of Israel, the theology of Israel, the experience of Israel. We're going to see all kinds of varied things in the text before us here which is a reminder that, that this is the way people are. And, and I don't just mean those people, I mean we people. You know, as you look at legislation, and uh, Philip Howard, a, a legal theorist, has done a great job of this in the United States. And uh, he, he, he keeps track of how much law applies to just about every human being. And he makes the argument that most of us commit some federal crime every week. Or, or, or we are complicit in it by buying the wrong kind of tuna in the wrong season or something. Because the law is now complex. It, it, it's so complex that it's virtually impossible for anyone to be absolutely certain we know what we're to do under every circumstance. And the law has now, through the administrative state, become so complex that there are laws that contradict other laws that, that, that no one even knows are on the books. But forget the, uh, the over-legislation there for a moment. The other point is that law is reactive rather than proactive, which is to say no one decided, you know, let's just put together this enormous body of law in 1776 or even in 1789 with the adoption and ratification of the Constitution, they didn't say, you know, what we need is several thousand volumes of federal statutes. That happened over time when, for instance, people made the decision, no, you can't fish there, you can fish here. All right, federal legislation. Or, you know, don't do that. Don't do that really seriously. Don't do that will make it a crime. And, of course, you had other things that happened in terms of the experience of the United States, such as what were basically regulative principles that just got incorporated into the law. But the point is that generally the codification of the law follows some problem. You say, okay, well, well we don't want that to happen again, so we'll make that a law. Now, while we're walking through the experience of Israel here, what we have at times is a need for understanding, of how does that actually apply? And, uh, and because Israel's laws, when it comes to, say, the Ten Commandments, they're very straightforward, and the number 10 is easy for us to remember. But when we walk through Leviticus, we know, okay, now here's another set of, of principles, or sometimes even, yes, legislation that, that is given even right down to what you can eat and under what circumstances. What you have in the book of Numbers is at least in part a, a, a walking through some of those issues again. And, uh, and, and with enough time having passed, that Israel now has some new questions to ask. And that, that comes up pretty quickly as we begin in verse 1 of chapter 9. When we 
ended last time at the conclusion of chapter 8. We're, we're now looking at the opening of chapter 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they'd come out of the land of Egypt. Okay, that's very interesting. In the first month of the second year. So here's something that's rather unique about numbers, and, and that is that we read books sequentially. Numbers is at least in part thematic, so that it jumps back to an earlier period. And, and here, we're straightforwardly told exactly when this word came to Moses, as you see here, in the first month of the second year after they came out of the land of Egypt. So that's very early. Saying, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time according to all its statutes and to all its rules you shall keep it. Now, that's already been given, so we don't need to be given it again. So Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover, and they kept the Passover in the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the people of Israel did. Okay, great so far, right? Perfect so far. This is what was commanded. Israel did exactly what was commanded. So why are we here? No, we're here because there is a problem. And because uh, there's nothing new in what we just read. The, the problem comes in verse 6. And there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day and those men said to him, we are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, wait that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Okay, one of the things we saw earlier in our study of Numbers is the, the ritual uncleanness that comes with touching a dead body, so much so that you are treated for a time as if you must be removed from the people until a time of cleansing, and then with the, the ritual washing, you can come back into the life of Israel. Now, there are a couple of questions perhaps we can ask here. Why this concern about touching a dead body? Well, you know, it's interesting that as you look at it, the primary concern of Israel was that a dead body represents that which the spirit has left, and, and, and thus all that is left is what we would consider to be the sinful flesh. That's, that's all that is left. And uh, if you're an, an anthropologist, you would say this is a continuation of a universal taboo. As Christians, we would say it's universal because of the Imago Dei. There's an instinct about the, 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 the problem of a dead body. It is interesting that in, in other times, more recent times, people have looked at this and said, look, this is a part of God's care for his people. Uh, contact with dead bodies is uh, often contact with illness and you know, all kinds of things. And so this is part of God's love and con concern for his people that he commands them to stay away from a dead body. But the issue here is that they're ritually unclean. And you know, what, the rabbis told stories and I don't know how plausible any of this is, except for the fact that you didn't have in the ancient world funeral homes or mortuaries you could call. So, in other words, someone's going to have to be ritually unclean for some period of time just to take care of a body. But what appears to be the case here is one of the rabbis said, a dead person fell on him. Now, I don't know that that meant that literally that was the only occasion where this might happen, a dead body falls on you. It's just a typical rabbinical way later of saying, you know, this can happen. All right. So what would happen? And, and it's interesting here that Moses doesn't answer. So that Moses is not a rabbi. So you, you notice here's something very interesting. Moses is not a rabbi. Moses is God's prophet. Moses is God's leader. God speaks to Moses and Moses to the people. So Moses here is not presented as one who's supposed to do the reasoning. God's going to speak through him. And, so, and he says that. You'll notice exactly what Moses said. Moses doesn't say, well, you know, let me tell you what makes sense to me. He says, wait that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. In verse 9, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, if any one of you or your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall keep the Passover to the Lord. 
In the second month, on the fourteenth day, at twilight, they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones, according to all the statute for the Passover. They shall keep it. But if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger sojourns among you and would keep the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to its rule, so shall he do. You shall have one statute, both for the sojourner and for the native." Well, be careful what you ask. In, in this case, God answered more than the presenting question. And so this does tell us that there were other complications that Israel experienced as it was, as it was observing the Passover. So it's very, very important that Moses said to those who came to him, wait, let's see what the Lord says. And then immediately the Lord speaks to Moses and concerning the one to the body had, had, had touched or had, they'd had contact and were originally unclean because of the dead body, and added to that person is someone who is on a long journey, both categories shall keep the Passover of the Lord, but delayed a month so that they, they go through the ritual uncleanness. Now, this is not what it might appear to us. So to us, it might appear, I mean, we do this all the time, right? We, we, we do this all the time. We have relatives, they're in a separate place, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to see them, but it's a, a month after that person's birthday, and we just decide, okay, we're going to celebrate your birthday when we're together. Uh, we're going to do that. You know, we can't get together at this particular time. We're going to have Christmas dinner on the 6th of January, because that's when we can all get together. It, it's not a matter of the keeping of the law. It, it makes sense to us. But you couldn't reschedule, in any sense, the Lord's festivals. That they belong to the Lord. The Lord established when they would be. And so this is the mercy of God to people who, for one reason or another, and, and the, the most important reasons are having touched a dead body or being on a long journey. They're given provision to be able to observe the Passover just delayed. Now, what's really interesting is what follows, because this wasn't what we were prepared to hear. And this is perhaps more important than anything that was asked of Moses or that the Lord was waiting on a word from the Lord about. It's verse 13. But if anyone who is clean, no contact with a dead body, and is not on a journey, fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. We just can't pass over that too quickly because those words have specific meaning. To be honest, we're not sure exactly which specific penalty is involved here. There are only three choices. The language, he shall be cut off from his people, basically comes down to three things. Number one is capital punishment. He shall be cut off from his people. It's used in different contexts, and the Old Testament clearly refers to capital punishment. Is this saying that someone who is not richly unclean and is not on long travel and thus is with Israel and should celebrate the Passover, if they refuse to do so, they shall be executed? Option one. Option two is that he shall be cut off from his people is exile, shall be cast out of the encampment, just cut off from the people. There are other circumstances in which this would be done. Now, we also need to recognize that that would be a death sentence without an execution. That would be a death sentence because there's simply no way to survive as a person outside the camp in the wilderness alone. So that is tantamount to the same. And, and the, the third option would be some kind of, 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 of escape or transfer whereby an, an, by some means or for some limited period of time, the person may be cut off. The, the, the reason why that third one is there is because it's just sometimes indeterminate how it was applied. 
But the first two are the main options, and both of them just underline the severity of God's judgment on the one who is in the camp and is not ritually unclean and does not observe the Passover. Now, this is where our logic, especially our logic in, say, 21st century America, given the voluntarism of religion, you know, nobody has to come to church, nobody has to keep coming to church, there's no law, uh, you're not, we're not assigned, you know, like in, in uh, previous epics of Christendom, we're not assigned our legal responsibility to a parish by birth or by address, you know, this is, uh, the mayor's not here taking role, um, we're in a very different position, and we tend to think of everything in those voluntarist terms. This is completely alien to the Old Testament. The problem with the one who is in the camp and, and, and who has not involuntarily been made richly unclean, not observing the Passover is cutting himself off from his people, cutting himself off from the promises of God, living in absolute defiance to God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of captivity to Pharaoh. And so it's as if you have a, an absolute subversive, an alien in the camp. Now, what makes this really fascinating is what follows after this because the one who is a son of Israel and will not observe the Passover he is to be cut off from his people, but the very next sentence says that if there is a sojourner and he is there and he will observe the Passover, he is to be included in the Passover. Okay, that's a thunderclap. And, and, and so that's the kind of thing which like devotionally we can read the passage and, and not recognize that a bomb's just gone off, but a bomb just went off. And this tells us that Israel is, yes, defined by patrilineage, it's defined by the 12 tribes, but it's defined by its obedience to Yahweh. And over time, that means there will be sons of Israel who are disobedient to Yahweh and they will be cut off. And there are sojourners who will be obedient to Yahweh and will be grafted in. And we don't know everything about what that means, but we do know that it's not a coincidence that these two things come together. The treason of a son of Israel who will not observe the Passover, defiance to God. And, and, and remember, the Passover is the memorial meal to commemorate God's rescue of his people from captivity and oppression in Egypt. What would it mean to refuse to observe the Passover? And then on the other hand, as we saw, and if a stranger sojourns among you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, it's a sweet statement. It's the son of Israel who would not. And now you have a stranger who would. It's very sweet and, and frankly surprising within the context He would keep the Passover to the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to its rule, so shall he do. You shall have one statute, both for the sojourner and for the native. Well, I, I really love studying the Scripture and being reminded of the fact that Scripture surprises us. You know, it kind of mugs us at times. It's like, you know, we know the text and we're walking down a familiar road and the next thing you know, boom. We kind of get hit over the head with a reality we hadn't noticed before. Because it is interesting to me that one question arises. Just one question, and, and this is in the expanding experience of Israel, one question arises, what happens if, as the rabbi said, a dead body falls upon an Israelite? What well, then? But God's answer doesn't just answer that question. It goes much further, and all of a sudden you realize God had more to say to his people. And, and by the time you get to the end of God's relatively short answer, he's brought up and he said, you know, if there's a son of Israel, he will not observe the Passover, cut him off from his people. If there's a sojourner who will, he shall. That's astounding. Okay, now remember that numbers is put together in such a way that we're not surprised when we go from one thing to another thing with absolutely no transition. 
So this is just a reminder of how the legislation was given by God through Moses, and it just, it, it's a continuation of this. And so the next thing is about the cloud that covered the tabernacle. Verse 15, on the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it always was. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening till morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued over the tabernacle abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. All right. All right. There's another bomb here. And, and, and you probably didn't notice it because we don't think in these terms. We uh, just experienced two absolutely glorious commencements at Southern Seminary and Boys College. We had uh, the college graduation out on the lawn. That was a real close call. The Lord allowed it to happen. That one was, uh, you know, with it, we had about an hour of decision making. Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Or have to go inside, which means a smaller crowd. The, the, the Lord allowed. It was a glorious day. As a matter of fact, just very, an incredibly comfortable day. Uh, and, and we saw all those graduates come. It's just glorious. And then the next day, the seminary graduation at the same hour, 10 o'clock in the morning, just, just, just glorious. Um, both times, Mary and I host a, 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 a reception at the home, and we have hundreds come through, like 700 at a time. It's magnificent. Um, we survive it uh, physically, it, but it's just glorious. We see all these graduates and their parents and sometimes their grandparents and their children and siblings. It's just it's a beautiful thing, just a, just a visual reminder of the promise of God. But we had several people come through, and, and by the way, uh, more than 20 nations. It's just just so moving. But we had people come through from exotic places like Phoenix. And I asked them how they were faring because the air here is a lot thicker than it is in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, I said, this is, this, is, this is what clouds look like. And, and trees, by the way, this is what trees look like. You've read of them, you've heard of them in poetry. Uh, this is what they look like. And uh, the reason I say that is because we take all this for granted here in the East in a way it's not taken in the West. But in this case, one of the things we need to look at, one of the bombs that goes off here is a cloud where Israel is wandering. There, there basically are no clouds. It's one of the most arid places in the entire globe. You'll recall that there, there's a time where it's mentioned that the promise of rain is a cloud. How big is the cloud? As big as a man's hand, a fist. In other words, you see this tiny little cloud and you go, maybe, 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 maybe there's going to be rain. And it's just a little spot way up there in all the blue. Um, so how would God show himself? And the pillar of fire by night, easy for us to understand. We, we understand the distinction between light and darkness and how much you know, light will stand out in the darkness. But we need to understand that the cloud over the tabernacle is such a remarkable thing in a place of basically zero humidity that the cloud is a spectacular miracle unto itself. In other words, the cloud, it shows the presence of God because otherwise 
no one has ever seen a cloud like this before. And in the Middle East, a cloud to hover over something close to land? They've never seen this before. This isn't London fog. This is the wilderness of Sinai. And so it's a beautiful thing. And again, and, and, you, know, you, you don't think of it until you all of a sudden realize these people have never seen a cloud like this before. A cloud that's not high in the sky, I mean very high in the sky, but a cloud that's hovering over the tent of meeting, over the tabernacle, it's, it, it, it shows, it reveals in an unmistakable way the presence of God. And when the cloud hovers over the tent of meeting, Israel camps, regardless of how long it's there. So long as the cloud is there, Israel camps. When the cloud moves, Israel moves. It's just very sweet. It's a reminder here in chapter 9 of the absolute dependence of the children of Israel. I mean, they're in the middle of the wilderness. They have no idea where they're going. They have no idea how to get where they are promised. They are absolutely vulnerable. But God takes care of them, and His presence is visible among them as signified by this cloud, a cloud where there are no clouds, a cloud that is near the ground, which they've never seen before, and a cloud that demonstrates the presence of God. And when the cloud moves, easy to understand, we move too. Now, just before we leave this, remember how complex this is. Remember how complex it is, the, the, the Kohathites having to put the, the, the tabernacle together. We saw where they were commanded to do this in order that the Levites may undertake the, the priestly role. And so the sons of Aaron are to superintend the entire process, but it's lengthy, it's massive, not to mention the fact you have hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be on the move. So I love this passage, and I love the kind of thing where you all of a sudden realize a cloud in the wilderness of Sinai, it's going to be saying something. And in this case, of course, it speaks the very presence of God. We move to chapter 10. Oh, and by the way, another just very important verse. There in verse 23 at the end. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. So, once again, it shows the centrality of God working through Moses. And it's just repeated in so many ways. But in this way... It, it, it's made clear that the Lord commands Moses, Moses commands the people, but the command the people receive is not from Moses, it's from God to Moses. Later, the reformers would point to this passage about Christian preaching and, and would, would point out that th this is the task of the Christian preacher, preaching the Word of God. It is, it is not to preach the preacher's command but for the preacher to preach the commands of God. It's not for the preacher to hand down precepts, but rather for the precepts of God to be delivered unto Christ's people. And uh, it, it's a very good verse just to remind us of how that happens. Now, the difference for us is that as the new covenant people, we have the inscripturated revelation. So, it, in other words, we're not waiting on the preacher to speak the word as if he is acting as a prophet through whom the Lord is revealing new revelation. No, we, we, we have the scriptures, but the preacher is to preach what the Lord has said. And this is where, again, as I, I take people to London, I love to take them into, you know, St. James Piccadilly because it's one of the churches destroyed in the great fire rebuilt by Christopher Wren. And when it's rebuilt, it's rebuilt with great soaring clear glass windows so that the people can read the scripture as they're holding it, as the preaching is taking place. And no one would have thought to do that a hundred years before because you didn't go to carry your Bible to, uh, to listen to the preaching of God's word and to study and, and, and read it yourself. It was, it was something very different where the scripture was not held as the central uh, the, the, the authority and, and where the preaching was not understood to be the central act of worship. So anyway, we come to chapter 10. Silver trumpets. 
The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. And when both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the heads of the tribes of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm, the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall blow the trumpets. The trumpet shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feast, and at the beginnings of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Trumpets. Trumpets. Silver trumpets. Now, now, just given what we know of the musical instruments of the, uh, of the era, and I say what we know, it's not because I have any expertise whatsoever, but those who are uh, experts in biblical background and, uh, for instance, looking at the musicology of Egypt, they've just left Egypt, there were pharaonic trumpets, that is to say, trumpets would blow for Pharaoh. And they were made out of hammered silver. So it looks like there's something that Israel would have seen to have some understanding because there's nothing in this text that says, this is what a trumpet is. So the assumption is they know what a trumpet is. They've seen trumpets. Now, when you think of Israel and you think of blowing something, well, Israel already has something to blow. It's a horn, a shofar. There's already a a horn for Israel to blow. But that has liturgical significance. This is a horn which is, first of all, for national defense. It it is to quickly mobilize Israel to march. Now, going all the way through, in particular, in particular, the First World War, both sides used trumpets as a main system of communication. Now, you may call it a bugle, but let's just say it's still still, still a trumpet. But in other words, there's an entire, the same thing with the Navy. There's an entire system of noise that can be made by this instrument that communicates all kinds of things. And some of you have had firsthand experience with that. In the military, my understanding is it has become much less an issue, understandably, given the rise of other technologies, and is now mostly ceremonial. But we do understand the ceremony from the playing of taps at a funeral uh, to the blast of, of, of reveille in the morning. You know, Winston Churchill at his state funeral, one of his requests is that taps be played at the end. He was twice first lord of the admiralty. And yet he asked that at the conclusion of taps that Reveille be played. Very interesting thing for Christians. That could be a very clear reference to the resurrection, which is to come. Trumpets have a very, very high visual, excuse me, auditory uh, impact. The, the, The sound of a trumpet is very clear and it carries. And so that's one of the reasons why Even in a camp as large as Israel with hundreds of thousands of people, these trumpets could be heard. And and there were certain signals, you know, whether it's it's one blast or two, it's long, it's to send a signal. And these trumpets were used, and of course they become a metaphor, they become very, very clear, trumpets in the morning. Uh, I remember a sermon preached by that, Harper Shannon, pastor of Huffman Baptist Church in Birmingham. He was famous... uh, president of the Alabama Convention for preaching a sermon about preaching. And uh, he used the biblical metaphor of trumpets in the morning. He said that's what the preacher should, should pray for, is that when he reads the text before God's people on the Lord's day, it's like the trumpets being blasted to call Israel uh, to attention. You also, of course, have the 
the reminder of what happens when the warnings are not issued in terms of the prophetic office. But in any event, these silver trumpets are a new thing early in the experience of Israel, and they are to be used for military mobilization. But you'll notice as the, this little passage comes to an end about the silver trumpets, they're also to be blown at feasts. Very interesting. So they're to be blown for two reasons. One really bad, like we have a military threat, we got to move, we, we have to mobilize, we're going to have to have, uh, you know, the, the response ready. And the other is for feasts and festivals. And I think we can understand that. You know, uh, I can still remember as a little boy growing up in a very tall steeple Southern Baptist church that I knew something was very, very special when I saw the trumpet players in the choir loft. I knew that we were getting ready for something big. And uh, because if you bring in the trumpets, you're, you're bringing in something big, loud, formal, beautiful. All right. What follows that passage is Israel's movement. Verse 11, in the second year, in the second month of the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the testimony. So Israel's going to move, right? Verse 12, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. They set out for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. The standard of the camp of the people of Judah set out first by their companies, and over their company was Nashon, the son of Amminadab. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Issachar were Nathaniel, the son of Zoar, and over the company of the tribe of the people of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helon. And when the tabernacle was taken down, the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari, who carried the tabernacle, set out. And the standard of the camp of Reuben set out by their companies, and over their company was Elizer, the son of Shadur. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Simeon was Shemuel, the son of Zerashadai. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Gad was Eliasaph, the son of Duel. Then, verse 21, the Kohathites set out carrying the holy things, and the tabernacle was set up before their arrival. And the standard of the camp of the people of Ephraim set out by their companies, and over their company was El Shema, the son of Amehud, and over the company of the tribe of the people of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Pezahur, and over the company of the tribe of the people of Benjamin was Abidan, the son of Gideoni. Then the standard of the camp of the people of Dan setting out as the rear guard of all the camps set out by their companies. And over their company was Eliezer, the son of Amishadai. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Asher was Pagiel, the son of Achran. And over the company of the tribe of the people of Naphtali was Ahira, the son of Enon. This was the order of march of the people of Israel by their companies when they set out. So here we have movement, the movement of the people of Israel, just exactly as it's called for. The cloud moves, so the people move. And they move by their companies. And again, we saw this earlier. We, we saw the recitation, even the census taken twice, where we noticed the size of Israel having grown according to the Lord's promise. And uh, we, we, we follow further, and we have the explicit instructions given. And so from this first base camp where they were led by the Lord, they are now told they're going to be led by the cloud and they're going to be moved by trumpets. And it happens. The cloud moves. This chapter basically tells us that everything's happening as it should. This chapter tells us that, that Israel is moving exactly as the Lord had told them they should move. They are obedient and if there's one thing we should see in this, it is the wonder of God's plan and the orderliness of obedience. So in other words, this is God's plan, because just imagine if the trumpets were to go off and you were to say to 600,000 people, uh, let's move, folks. What is that going to look like? And so the Lord has given to them, right down to the Kohathites and, and their responsibility for carrying the things, the holy things, Everything is in order. And so this passage just tells us that Israel now knows what to do. So th th this is God's providence demonstrated in God's plan. 
and, and God's people are obeying the plan. It's a beautiful picture. You come to this, you realize this is exactly what's supposed to happen. Everyone is moving exactly as he should move. And these names are recited just as historical evidence of the fact that, yeah, these were the people who were at the time the leaders of their clans and tribes and peoples. But then there's an odd passage that follows, and it, it, it maybe is a bit odder than, than we'll recognize at first. Beginning of verse 29, and Moses said to Hobab, the son of Ruel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord has said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go, I will not depart to my own land, or I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And, and he said, please do not leave us, for you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them three days' journey to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them who hate you flee from you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Well, you perhaps have noticed a question that comes to our minds with this, and that is, we thought Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. And, and so... What are we dealing with here with Ruel? Well, there are limited options. One of the things you have going on in the Old Testament is often that persons will have more than one name, Jacob, Israel. So you have more than one name, and so you have to follow when one name's being used and then when another name's being used. And, and so that, that might be the first thing that would come to mind. So the first thing that might come to mind is that um, it, it is that we're talking here about the same man, the father-in-law of Moses, Jethro. Okay, there's a problem with that, though. And, 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 and the problem is that Jethro has already gone back in other words, we, Jethro's already gone back to his people. The, the, he was the priest of Midian, and he, he gave Moses advice, but he, he then departed. So if, if this is just a different name and it's supposed to mean the same person, that, that, that's not going to be easy for us to figure out. I mean, it, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. And so evidently Jethro changed his mind. But the, the, uh, the other problem is the continuity of names in general, where sometimes, to be honest, we have some broken knowledge of who is whose or who is what. That's not to be unexpected given the size of the population here and given, frankly, the, 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 the relative, relatively few names that are given to us out of way too many people just for us to be able to keep track. Throughout the history of the interpretation of Scripture, it's also been noted that in this case, uh, this could be the son-in-law, uh, excuse me, it could be that, that, that the man here is the father-in-law or the brother-in-law, let's put it that way, that's easier, uh, of, uh, of, of Moses. And so that certainly would fit the category. And so the you look at different English translations, you're going to see that term translated somewhat differently. And so, I just want to be honest and say, I'm not sure if this is Jethro in a different name in a different context, or if this is Jethro's son. And, you know, you could, you could say, well, maybe Moses has more than one wife, but that, that's not in the text. So, I mean, th then we get into all kinds of things beyond. Uh, in, in other words, we, 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 don't, we don't have an explanation for another father-in-law. But here's the thing. This is absolutely non-controversial in the experience of Israel. 
So in other words, the people of Israel understood this immediately. There's no, there's no dissonance there. Whatever dissonance is there is in our understanding more than 2,000 years later. And uh, so the best way to read this is exactly as the text gives it to us. But the point here is that it does appear, it does appear that the man did what Moses asked and stayed. And so it appears that the plea that was made, please do not leave us for you know where we should camp in the wilderness and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. And then when you go to verse 33, and it starts out, so they set out from the mount of the Lord three days journey. The they appears to include this sojourner in their midst, the relative of Moses. Language that we will hear otherwise in Scripture comes up in verses 35 and 36. And whenever the Lord, whenever the ark set out, Moses said, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. So this, this will show up in the Psalms. This will show up in the, the worship of Israel. And let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the 10,000 thousands of Israel. Just very sweet language. Becomes a part of the liturgical language of Israel. So we've covered two chapters. We've, we've walked through the Lord dealing with his people in this way. And uh, just is a sweetness to it. And I love the fact that there are surprises in it. And uh, all this just reminds us that even as we think, okay, we know these things already. No, we don't. No, we don't. We can study these things our entire lives, and this is the way God's Word works. And then you all of a sudden notice, I hadn't seen that before. I didn't put that in context before. I hadn't thought about a cloud in the middle of the desert and how weird that is, and that's the point before. It's an honor to study the Word with you. And uh, we'll look forward to doing so when next we gather again. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for all you give us in your word. We pray to be good stewards in such a way that in ways that we do not expect, thoughts driven from these very texts arise in our minds, even in these coming days, even in this coming week. We pray this to your glory in Christ's name. Amen.